I, early in my career, decided to focus on this problem as a heart surgeon. And what I've come to realize is that we are doing a very lousy job in the battle against heart disease. So over the past decade or so, I've shifted my focus, and I now want to prevent the heart attacks, prevent the need for heart surgery. And I do believe that the vast majority of heart disease is preventable. And I will know that I've succeeded in my mission when heart disease is no longer the number one killer. How common would you say is heart disease right now in the United States? Yeah, so it's incredibly common. About 650,000 people die from heart disease every year. That's about one out of every four people that dies. Someone in this country has a heart attack every 33 seconds. And while we've gotten better at keeping people alive, making sure that they survive their heart attack, for instance, we have completely failed in the prevention of heart disease. And every year, heart disease uh, becomes more and more common. And that's what we need to change, ultimately. What can be done um, for us and that you mentioned in your book to lower that incidence? Because I believe it's really easy. I think it's especially about food and many other lifestyle changes. What are specifically those that are the most important things that we can do to lower our chances of having a heart attack and not being on your operating table? Yeah, so this really comes down to first principles, fundamental thinking. If we don't know what causes a problem, causes a disease, we have no real hope in preventing it. And the problem around heart disease is we have become distracted. We have bought into the narrative that cholesterol is the cause of heart disease, and it's not. It might be a contributor, it plays a role in the process, but it's clearly not the cause of heart disease. And therefore, by focusing only on lowering cholesterol, managing cholesterol, it's been very ineffective. So we need to get back to what the true root cause or root causes of heart disease are. And this comes down to insulin resistance and inflammation. And only when we address those things, and you're right, that can largely be addressed by things like diet and lifestyle. Um, but we're going to need to shift the focus, the conversation around heart disease to those issues and to addressing those issues. And that's what's going to allow us to make real progress against heart disease. So you mentioned that cholesterol is not the main uh, boogeyman as we think it is for heart disease. As many people have heard, you should lower your LDL, you should increase your HDL, increase your HDL, yeah, fine, but lower your LDL because it's the bad cholesterol that clogs your arteries. Why is it not the big boogeyman as we think it is? it was on the 50s, on the 60s? Yeah, so first of all, we need to understand that the um, science, the studies that linked LDL cholesterol or at first total cholesterol with heart disease show pretty weak associations, right? And, you know, many people in your audience might be familiar with the concept of, you know, the, the difference between associations uh, and cause, causation. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, one of the ways that we separate that out, right, when we see things that look like they're associated, we talk about the strength of the association. And when you look at something like LDL cholesterol, total cholesterol, you see very weak associations. You see increases in risk of, you know, 1.4, 1.5x, whereas things that are truly causal, right? And the classic example of this is smoking and lung disease, right? You see 10, 20x increases uh, in lung cancer in people who smoke. Um, so that alone should give us some indication, right, that LDL isn't the true problem. Um, incidentally, and we'll talk more about this, right, when you look at insulin resistance in heart disease, you do see 5x, 6x, 7x increases, uh, which tells you you're getting closer to the true root causes. 
Now, I think the problem that came along with cholesterol, there are two things. Number one is heart disease is and was a massive problem, right? And uh, you go back to the 1940s, the 1950s, uh, when the rates were exploding and people didn't know why. And, you know, it looked like this cholesterol had something to do with it. And there was a lot of enthusiasm that this was going to be the solution to the problem. And, you know, people got on board. And then that got compounded, right, when we now had medications that were released, uh, statins being the first ones, or the most popular ones at least, uh, that could lower cholesterol. So now you had what looked like it was part of the process and association. We had a way to treat it, right? And, you know, clinicians, doctors, they want to help, they want to treat things. Mm -hmm. And so this sort of became a runaway train. But here we are now 40, 50 years into that belief that cholesterol is the main cause of heart disease. We've done a great job, you know, at treating cholesterol. When you look at uh, cholesterol levels on a population uh, basis, they are lower than they have ever been, yet heart disease keeps getting worse. Mm -hmm. So now it's time to step back and say, maybe we got something wrong. Uh, but again, we're dealing with an institutional problem. And the approach is just, well, it's not working because we're not doing it hard enough, right? We need to get cholesterol lower levels even lower. We need to start yeah. earlier. And it's just sort of, like I said, this runaway train that uh, the at the institutional level, it can't be, you know, kind of step back and have that reflection of maybe cholesterol isn't the problem to start with. Uh-huh. And, and I totally agree with you. Uh, our cholesterol has been the lowest as ever. We've been using more statins than ever. And we still have heart disease growing, growing, and growing. So maybe it is something else. And so I think the population is a little confused. I think um, they do not know because many different experts say different things. Some say that for you, you need to lower cholesterol. You need to avoid saturated fat and all of that. And some others say that you actually should reduce the amount of carbohydrates that you eat, focus on insulin resistance. So what markers should you really know that you are metabolically unhealthy? And also what, I would say, what number should we seek for? Yeah, so I always start with the most basic markers of metabolic health, right? And there are five of them that are essential for people to know. Uh, the first two you don't need blood work. You probably don't even need to go to your doctor for. Uh, so we have your waist circumference, right? All you need is a tape measure, measure at the level of your belly button, best to do it first thing in the morning. And if you're a man, your goal is for that to be less than 40 inches. If you're a woman, you want it to be less than 35 inches. The second metric we look at is blood pressure. And again, you can measure this at home. You can order a blood pressure cuff. Uh, you can go to almost every pharmacy and grocery store these days, and they have a little kiosk to check it. Or the vast majority of the time when you go to the doctor's office, they're going to check it for you. And your goal is for your blood pressure to be less than 130 over 85 without the use of medication. If you've already been started on medication because of high blood pressure, it's an indicator that you may not be metabolically healthy. The other three measures are going to come from some basic blood work. And again, the vast majority of doctors get this blood work done as part of your sort of routine annual. The problem is they don't look at it in the context of these metabolic health metrics. So we have your fasting blood glucose level. Uh, you want that to be less than 100 milligrams per deciliter. Um, again, without the use of medication, if you've been diagnosed with type 2 diabetes, if you've been started on medication for high blood sugar, you are metabolically unhealthy. Uh, some people, instead of the fasting glucose, will look at the hemoglobin A1C, which gives you an idea of your average blood sugar over about a three-month period. And if you're looking at that, you want it to be less than 5.7%. And then we do look at cholesterol numbers, 
but we don't look at that LDL. We don't look at that total cholesterol that most doctors are focused on. We look at the HDL cholesterol that you mentioned earlier. And, you know, this is uh, something that we want a higher amount of, right? And this sometimes confuses people because they hear cholesterol, they think lower, but HDL cholesterol, you want it to be higher. Specifically, if you're a man, you want it to be over 40 milligrams per deciliter. If you're a woman, you want it to be over 50 milligrams per deciliter. And the last measure we're going to look at is on that cholesterol panel. Um, it's a number called your triglyceride level. It's a little bit different than cholesterol, but uh, we kind of measure it together with it. And this you do want to be lower. And specifically, you want your triglycerides to be less than 150 milligrams per deciliter. So you put that all together. Uh, we have five metrics. If three or more of those are not in the healthy ranges that I mentioned, you are diagnosed with what we call the metabolic syndrome. And it means that you are insulin resistant and you're at high risk for things like heart disease, cancer, Alzheimer's disease, chronic kidney disease. Uh, you can go down and down the list. Almost all of the top 10 causes of death and the chronic diseases that we struggle with in the United States and worldwide are associated with the metabolic syndrome. So that's a great place to start. You can get a lot more in depth, and we'll maybe talk about some of that as we go along. But uh, if people just start there, it's going to be a huge improvement because the vast majority of people don't know these numbers or haven't put them all together in this context of figuring out your metabolic health. Is that solely preventable by diet? Can we make those markers in a better range by diet within itself? So I think diet is the most powerful tool that we have to focus on. It may not be everything. It may not be the only piece of the puzzle, uh, but I think it's the most important one. And if you're not getting the diet right, some of the other things that come into play, like getting good sleep, getting enough activity, managing your stress, it's going to be very hard to overcome the poor diet. So I always start with, let's get the diet right. Let's use the diet as one of the tools to improve your metabolic health, reverse insulin resistance, um, and then we can continue to build upon that with the other lifestyle stuff that we talk about. So what would you say, based on your clinical experience, what is the perfect diet for you to reverse those metabolic problems? Yeah, so the perfect diet is the one that's going to reverse those metabolic mm -hmm. problems, right? And I always tell people mm -hmm. there's no one right diet for everyone. Uh, first of all, the most important thing about choosing your dietary strategy is you have to be able to do it. You have to be able to stick to it. It needs to fit within your daily life. Um, now, the general framework is the more metabolically unhealthy you are to start with, the lower your carbohydrate intake needs to be. So low-carb diets are extremely effective at reversing insulin resistance and the metabolic syndrome. And so that's usually the direction that I point most people in. Um, the second principle that I think is important is your body needs to be able to absorb the nutrients that you're eating. And you, uh, so, you know, the foods that you're eating should be dense in nutrients and bioavailable, we call it. Uh, and this really leads us to animal foods first and foremost. Animal proteins combined with the fat that comes with it are the foods that we primarily evolved eating as human beings. For the millions and millions of years of our existence as human beings, our diet was primarily animal-based. And grains, carbohydrates, these things, fruits, they only started to come in in little amounts. Uh, and um, it's only very recently, 
right? It, it's a tiny dot in time, the past, you know, couple of hundred years that we've had these things in abundance. And uh, it's an even shorter period of time, right? The last 50 to 100 years that we've had them year round, right? That we could, uh, you know, move them between climates, right? So that they were always available to us. So we need to keep that in mind, right? Our bodies evolved primarily on animal proteins, animal fats. Those are the most nutrient dense, the most bioavailable form of the nutrients to us. And that's what we should really focus our, base our diet on.